Welcome to the place where we gain knowledge through the lens of creativity. I am Aaron Dworkin, and this is Artful Science. Thanks again for joining me here on Artful Science. Today's show is Red Mars, Gray Moon, Why the Weather in Space Matters. And my guest is Sarah Noble, planetary geologist and program scientist at NASA. Sarah, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's so great that you're here. So, you know, I always like to just dive right in. So. I always thought there was like no weather in space, no atmosphere, those types of things. So first of all, what on earth is space weathering? So space weathering is basically all of the things that happen on worlds like, like the moon where there isn't really an atmosphere. So it includes how the way that the moon interacts with the sun. There's particles always coming off of the sun all the time. Uh, and those are, are impacting into the moon. There's also micrometeorites that, of course, burn up in our atmosphere. We get big, me big meteorites maybe come down to Earth, but the little ones all burn up. But if you don't have an atmosphere, every time anything hits, it's melting and vaporizing the surface, right? Even little, tiny little microscopic things. Uh, and there's also like galactic and cosmic rays and things, high energy particles that are zipping around the solar system and occasionally run into us or run into the moon. Uh, so the collection of all of these things to combine is what we refer to as, as space weathering. Gotcha, gotcha. So is technically in a way, do we have, do we kind of, even though we have an atmosphere, do we have space weathering too? So our atmosphere protects us from a lot of things. Our magnetic field and our atmosphere keep us safe from a lot of these, these um, sort of high energy things. It blocks the, the, the solar wind, it blocks, you know, these micrometeorites burn up in our atmosphere. And so we're pretty well protected. Gotcha. Awesome. Awesome. So it, it's just kind of this odd thing. So as, as you know, these, you know, various particles are bombarding the surface of planets, what makes, you know, something like Mars so much different from the moon, right? Why is literally the Mars uh, or the, uh, the moon basically gray, but Mars is red? What, what has happened? Sure, right, so they're actually made of m most of the same ingredients, right, so is the Earth. We all sort of came from the same sort of primordial soup, uh, started out with many of the same ingredients, maybe in slightly different proportion, but, uh, you know, a lot of the same stuff. It's not super exotic, um, but, and, you know, and just a quick, just a quick question on that. What, what, what is that type of stuff? Like, what is, what is most of the moon or Mars? I mean, you know, the rocks are, are sort of the sorts of same sorts of rocks that we often find on the earth. It's, you know, it's wow. aluminum, calcium, iron, magnesium, you know, it's a wow. lot of the same basic minerals and mineralogy. Wow. Um, Mars actually does have a, have a small atmosphere. It's about 5% of what our atmosphere is. So it's pretty thin, but it's enough that it has wind and dust storms. Uh, and the dust on Mars is this very fine red, oxidized material. It's oxidized. It's, it's basically rust, right? Like the, like the rust that develops on, on your car or whatever, right? That red material. And it's, and it's just, it's dispersed all the way around the, around the moon and, or sorry, Mars in this like global layer of dust that just sort of coats everything in red. And so when we look at it through a telescope or, you know, even when we're driving around on a rover, you see our rover is coated in that red dust. Um, just everything is very dusty on the, on Mars, right? But the moon, um, there, there is that, that it's the opposite. Everything is very reduced instead of oxidized. Um, and so it's, it's, it's very gray. Gotcha, gotcha. And why, do we know why there is this dust on Mars and not on the moon? Is there some particular reason for that? Right, so the, the wind carries the dust around on Mars. But the reason why um, there is this oxidized layer on, on Mars is still a little bit controversial. I'm a lunar geologist, so uh, forgive me for not knowing all the details of the Mars, but, but uh, you know, it, it seems like uh, Mars, you know, probably had a lot more, um, uh, had a lot more um, 
water and carbon dioxide and other things uh, long ago, but it's, it's lower gravity. And so it's, it's a lot of that stuff is getting lost to space. And, and if you got, you know, water, H2O, the hydrogen is easier to get, is lighter. It's easier to get lost to space than the oxygen. And so somehow you end up with extra oxygen lying around and that's how you manage to oxidize things. That's probably that's, an oversimplification that the Mars geologists are probably shaking their head at me, but. <laughs> no, no, well, and, and, and as an artist, I am learning, so that's great. Uh, so, so going back to, to kind of the moon and, and thinking about this, right, and thinking about this idea of space weathering, thinking of, of just learning more about the moon's surface, and, and I might even touch a little on, on whether we'll be going back or not, um, uh, but why? What, right? Why is this important? Why, why is learning more about the moon's surface important? As I think about, you know, as artists and I've got, you know, trying to figure out how I'm going to play concerts again or something, right? Why is, why is this kind of knowledge about the moon important? Why should I care? So we, we refer to the moon as, you know, planetary scientists in general refer to the moon as sort of the cornerstone of, of planetary science. It is the place where we, it's the first place where we have like, learn what other planets besides the Earth are and do and, and react and evolve. Um, and, and it's the one that we have the most information. We've been studying it for a very long time. We brought back those samples during Apollo. Uh, and so we've been able to compare them to our remote sensing data. You know, and, so, um, and so we can use that. You know, when you, we only have one subject to study, Right, it's really hard. And you think if you're, you know, if you're, you know, I always, I always tell this when I when I talk to kids, I always, I always give them this analogy, right? If you were an alien and you came and you wanted to study humans and you came and you studied one person and just one person, what would you learn about humans, right? Well, you'd learn, you know, oh, they all have brown hair and blue eyes, right? Uh, but then, <laughs> you know, but that's not true, right? You know, if you, and as you start to study more humans, you learn what are what are the normal things and what are the abnormal things, and and you know, you know, if, you know. Think about things like the vaccine. We, we you know, we, we studied this vaccine. We gave it to thousands and thousands of people to see how they would react, right? And so, you know, if you can only study the Earth, it's very difficult to, to understand, um, you know, what is normal, what are the fundamental processes, and what is, like, abnormal that are, like, the weird quirks of the Earth. And so by studying the Moon, by studying, you know, Mars and the other planets in our solar system, we can sort of begin to understand what the what these you know fundamental processes are and how they work and then we can understand you know where the moon where the where the earth is going how is it going to evolve what's next right yeah and so as you think about that and what you've learned about the moon both where, where it's at now and and where it used to be potentially um, what would you say are one or two of the most relevant things that that we've learned that give us a better sense of of ourselves or, or understanding of earth yeah so we think that you know the earth and the moon are are inextricably com, uh, intertwined right we formed together there was a there was a big impact back you know when the earth was still young and forming something big hit it something like the size of mars impacted the earth and threw out all this material and that material came together to form the moon um, and, and that's, you know, and so since then we have sort of marched along together in our, in our little space. And the thing with the moon is that we have a perfect history there. The history on the moon goes back four and a half billion years. The history on the earth gets recycled. Our rocks, you know, because of plate tectonics, our rocks are constantly overturning and getting recycled and we make new rocks. And so most of the rocks on the earth are pretty young, but the moon has that whole history all the way back four and a half billion years. And so as we learn to read that, we can understand what was going on in our solar system during that, those, that whole period when, where that history no longer exists on the earth. Wow, gotcha, gotcha. And, and is there a, a sense of, you know, does the moon just stay static basically? In other words, we're changing because of, of, of tectonics and because of, of our atmosphere and all of that. Is the moon stable or do we think it was different, you know, millions of years ago? Yeah, so, so we've been, um, you know, we, there are subtle things changing on the moon. It, it is mostly cold and dead now, right? So you, you can see the, the dark parts of the moon. Those are places where volcanic lavas used to flow out on the surface. So the moon was at one time, like three, three and a half billion years ago, very volcanically active. Um, but it's pretty much cold now. The moon is a lot smaller than the earth, so it cooled off faster. So it's mostly cold, but we do still see changes. We do still see tectonic changes. Um, there's these little wrinkle ridges that form as the moon continues to, to cool, it shrinks. And so in order to take up that shrinkage, we get these little 
what we call wrinkle ridges, these little faults uh, and cracks, right, that actually cause moonquakes. So during Apollo, we had a whole seismic network set up on the moon. And so for several years we were measuring and you can, you can measure the, the, the moonquakes on the moon. Um, so it is still so there are active. Literally, there are literally moonquakes. There are literally moonquakes, yes. So it's still active in that sense. We can also see current impacts, right? It's still the, the you know, thing, bigger things are still impacting the moon in addition to these tiny little micrometeorites we were talking about space weathering. Bigger things are still impacting the moon too. Um, and we can see them. We've had, we have an orbit right now, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. It's been there for about a decade and it, you know, it takes pictures you know, every day as it goes around. Uh, and so we, we've been studying the surface and every now and again, we find a new impact and we've found hundreds and hundreds over the, the lifetime of, of LRO, and so we can keep track of how often things are hitting. And again, remember, the moon is in our same neighborhood, so it gives us a sense of how many things are also, you know, hitting the Earth. And so, uh, right, yeah, and that's that's always something. I mean, I when I was a kid, I would like fall asleep the very first time I heard about asteroids and meteors and stuff. I was just like, oh my gosh, when are we going to get hit? So, um, <laughs> and is there, by the way, there's a, a total aside, a little bit off of the of the moon, but is there a sense that there will be a big asteroid at some point? Like, is there a kind of time trajectory that they think within X amount of years, there is some level of likelihood? So it's, it's sort of random. And yes, things are hitting us um, all the time. Uh, and what do you mean by big, right? So we are actually tracking, uh, you know, most of the big things in our, in our solar system. And we think we have found, you know, most of the, you know, sort of planet killer sized, uh, things and we're tracking them so we would know well in advance if any of them uh, were coming towards us and we are working on you know getting down to smaller and smaller uh, things to, to sort of make sure we, we have some advance warning of that sort of thing but but yeah things are, are, are hitting us pretty regularly and they will continue to do so. All right. Wow. It's it's a wild world out there, a uh, wild extra world out there. And so uh, we're just about out of time, but I wanted to ask two additional questions. So one, just as you think about all of space weathering and all that, what would you say is the most you know, uh, interesting or compelling thing that you've learned thinking and understanding just about this aspect of how things are being impacted in space? Um, apologize, that was my cat. <laughs> <laughs> doing some gymnastics on the other side of the room. Right, no worries. <laughs> um, you, know, I, you know, maybe it's not a big important thing, but one of my favorite things about space weathering on the moon is that there are these things on the moon called lunar swirls. You know, I don't know if you've ever heard of lunar swirls, but you should look them up. They're beautiful. Right. Um, there are these places on the moon where we think there are sort of magnetic field lines underneath that are affecting the way that the surface weathers in certain places. Um, and we don't really understand it, but it creates these really beautiful sort of swirly patterns, lines of light and dark um, that are just amazing uh, and still kind of a mystery. Uh, and, and one of the places we're really anxious to get back to as we, as we move into this uh, new era of lunar exploration, as we get down to the surface uh, with robots and humans, uh, that one of those swirls is very high on our list of places to visit to try and figure out what's going on. I can only imagine. And, and is that something that the next visit to the surface will check out? And, uh, and what is that for my audience? So uh, humans uh, are planning a return to the moon in uh, 2024. We are aiming for the, the South Pole um, or somewhere near the South Pole, probably not exactly at the South Pole, uh, but you know, somewhere uh, near the poles, um, which is exciting. It is a, it's a very far away from, from the Apollo site. So we're going to get a look at some like brand new territory um, that is you know very exciting for science. We we've just been we've been discussing over the last few months what is the science that we want to do with humans when we get to this place and and just put out our report last week in fact about all of the amazing things that we want the astronauts to be able to do and the kinds of samples that we want them to collect so that we can learn about the geology at the South Pole so that we can learn about you know the, there are these permanently shadowed regions at the poles. Uh, where we think that that volatiles, water and other sort of volatile elements build up that we might be able to use as resources, but also from a science perspective, that's really cool. Uh, and we, we're trying to understand how water moves around the moon. That will help us understand how water moves around the solar system and, you know, eventually where, you know, how that water got to Earth and, and where it's going and all of those things. So. Absolutely. And any chance that there could be signs of, you know, microscopic life in that water? 
No. Ah, okay. <laughs> I hate to burst your will. No, no. Yeah. Um, the, the, the environment on the moon is very harsh again. No atmosphere, very high radiation, um, all those things. Uh, and inside of these permanently shadowed regions, the temperatures um, are the coldest temperatures we've measured anywhere in the solar system. It is, it, it is beyond cold. And it is, it is so cold. It's just you know, a few degrees above absolute zero. It's like 40 degrees above absolute zero. Cold, so cold that like chemistry is just not really happening at those temperatures. <laughs> wow, got you. Cool. Awesome. Well, this is fascinating. I have absolutely learned new things about the moon that I did not know. Uh, so it is very, very exciting. And one just last question, you know, I'm always trying to come at things from an arts perspective for, for my audience. Do you have a particular, you know, area of the arts that you are interested in or that you actually practice yourself? Yeah, I actually, I actually am an artist. Uh, I don't know if you can see the couple of paintings on the wall behind me. Um, yes, yes. Yeah. In beautiful. fact, in fact, this this one right here is one of my is one of my favorite paintings of all time. You can I don't I don't know what if you're getting a good enough angle of it, but you know it's yeah. basically the, the the footprint of Apollo. It's called um, "Don't Tell Me the Sky's the Limit" when there are footprints on the moon. Um, which, <laughs> <laughs> I think oh, it's great and I think speaks to you know the ripple effect of, of the fact that we did this really big thing uh, for humankind but I always love that that picture of the footprint that has become this sort of symbol of like humanity on another world whatever but that's not why that picture was taken that picture was taken purely for science reasons we were like trying to understand the mechanics of soil and what how deep would your foot sink and how you know what is the angle of repose of the of the sand it was entirely taken for science reasons but has come to mean so much more I think to humanity Oh, wow. And I think a, a great example of how literally the arts and sciences are completely intertwined. This is amazing. And Sarah Noble, thank you so much for helping us gain knowledge through the lens of creativity here on Artful Science. Thanks. This was fun.